Well, welcome everyone. Today is August 16th, 2021. We are recording a show for a month from now, September 15th. Um, I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. My guest today is Dr. Vikas Saini, the president of the Lown Institute, which ranks hospitals based on social responsibility. A little bit about uh, Dr. Saini, he's a cardiologist by training. He studied with Dr. Bernard Lown, uh, the Lown Institute's founder at Harvard. He's the co-chair of the Right Care Alliance. And then on and on, a list of accomplishments. Uh, he's an expert in optical, so excuse me, optimal medical management of cardiology conditions, uh, medical overuse, hospital performance, uh, and health equity. So thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And um, and just for our audience, uh, where 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 do you live right now? I live in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, right near Fresh Pond, if anybody knows where that is. Right. And then you, you mentioned you were just up in, in Vermont over the weekend, which I think is awesome. I was. I uh, My wife and I went up to the Northeast Kingdom and uh, spent a little time up there. We really enjoyed it. We got very lucky with the weather after the heat wave. Yes, yeah, and uh, and then picked up my daughter from camp. She'd been at uh, Kill Elite for seven weeks straight. So, wow, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And did they do okay through uh, through COVID? Remarkably well. I think they were testing once a week, but everybody was negative when they walked in, and they didn't have a case. So that's great. Yeah, that was. So great. tell us a little bit about how you uh, first became interested in, in medicine and and cardiology specifically. Sure. Well, uh, there's, <laughs> I could go on about that. In terms of medicine, um, you know, um, in retrospect, as is often the case as we get older, I recognize there were motivations I was that were unconscious at the time. But, you know, my father had wanted to be a doctor and couldn't afford to. He was too, grew up too poor. The family lost it all in the Depression. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was a bright kid and he kind of encouraged me and being rebellious, I said, no way, no how, I really wasn't going to do this. Um, And then I took a year off from college and I traveled, I went to Europe and I went to India and, you know, I traveled by buses and trains and saw huge swaths of the world, really. And, And the thing that struck me the most was how much desperate need there was and you know, I had often thought about social ideas and, and social practices, and I was interested in economics and politics and this and that. But really, on that trip, I recognized that it was really hard to beat the good you can do one-on-one in the exam room. Uh, and that there was just something about that that was fundamental, and there was such a need. So, so I came back from that year off, and I announced much to my father's delight <laughs> that I was going to apply to medical school. Oh, that's great. And then you, you did that and you got into medicine uh, and started focusing on uh, all of the learning and, and struggles that you have to go through. Then, But at some point you, you saw that there was an opportunity or a need for improvement in the way that hospitals operate. Can you talk a little bit about that uh, for the audience? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> I think uh, I, I'd have to start first by uh, how I actually got to Boston to work with Dr. Lam because I did medicine. Uh, I was at Johns Hopkins and uh, there I was kind of dazzled by the chief of cardiology and by the uh, nature of the care and the intensity of it. Um, I like to say I was, I was, uh, you know, taken in by maybe all the wrong things by the devices, the drama, the, you know, all this kind of stuff sure. as a young man. And I loved it. I was not, in fact, I traded out of other rotations so I could be in the coronary care unit. Uh, and that was every other night. So I had like six months of every other night, uh, but I loved it. And then I decided to do cardiology based on all that uh, and came to Boston uh, to work with Dr. Lown. And I didn't know that much about him other that he was a revered figure. He'd helped develop the defibrillator. He had 
kind of written the book on arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death and you know was just a giant figure um i knew that what i didn't know was how much of an iconoclast he was and in particular by the time i got there he had a firm view that there was way too much bypass surgery and and then eventually stenting came along and so he had a view of the world and the motto really that um, he imparted on all his trainees was you know do as much as possible for the patient and as little as possible to the patient wow. and and uh so that kind of ethic you know it's like how, how it is when you grow up with something like that i wasn't really aware of how unique it was until I went out into practice and then I saw that it, you know practices very widely and of course people at Dartmouth would uh, recognize that Jack Wenberg and, and Ella Fisher and everybody up there pioneered this work to show that that is really true and that a lot of that variation is really not based on evidence or what we know um, and so I think when I recognized that um, and saw how much variation there was, I, I got involved with trying to, uh, you know, find pathways of care that were a little uh, more efficient, that were, you know, didn't uh, take up as many resources, that didn't subject patients as, to as much risk. And so on all those grounds, I got very interested in the kind of workings of medicine. And so I actually started a primary care network and we took insurance contracts and started understanding how to manage care with an eye on how, um, you know, what's necessary and what's unnecessary. So that's what got me really deeply involved and I started understanding how hospitals work better, how, you know, doctors and, and outpatient and home health and all of that started working. And I started understanding the business side of that too. So I had a good sense of how the system works. So when Dr. Lamb kind of persuaded me to come back to Boston, I was in practice on Cape Cod. Uh, he persuaded me to come back to Boston and lead the Institute. It's kind of natural to start doing work in this area, but it was, I would say it was a slow start. It was a very slow ramp up. Right. So for the audience here, there's many people who know exactly uh, what you're talking about. And then there's others that, that are saying, wait a minute, I'm not following. And, and what we're talking about here is variations uh, in, in practice, uh, whether that's individual types of practice, uh, departments or entire health systems that often vary by region. Uh, Dartmouth, Hitchcock and many others have started bringing that out uh, through review of, of data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and other data sources, and then um, started looking at the outcomes. Do the outcomes match the uh, amount of things, as you said, are done to a patient? And in fact, they don't match. And if anything, they're inverted in that type of relationship. And uh, But many people have read about that. They've read Atul Gawande's and other, uh, other articles on that. And it is fascinating uh, as we try to recognize that Things like standardization really do lead to reliability and controlled innovation is how we're going to improve outcomes but that that has to be done in, in a controlled manner and your organization Lown, uh starts to point that out as far as what hospitals uh, do and how they vary and, and you come up with this um this hospital index can you talk about that some sure absolutely you know we decided that it would be useful to begin looking at hospitals and, and you know performance of hospitals through a different lens. Um, you know we're aware of the US, everybody's heard of the US news rankings. There are other rankings. IBM does one, Leapfrog has them. And so the last thing the world needed was another ranking. So we weren't sure how we'd be received, but we did feel that there was a lot that was, being left on the table and amongst those things was this understanding that you know there is variability in care and that some places and some physicians and some hospitals you know will have a lot less unnecessary care others will have more 
we also recognized and one thing i shared with dr lowne really was a very broad view of medicine how medicine fits in with our society as a whole how health fits in with our society as a whole and so you know we recognize that there's so many variables that go into good outcomes you know there's all the stuff that uh, happens way before the hospitalization uh, many people talk these days about uh, a term called social determinants of health and really that's just a recognition which has now been proven many times over that the vast majority of our life expectancy and our health and healthiness is unrelated to medical care, is unrelated to hospital care. Um, and it's really related to things that happened way before, things like nutrition, prevention, exercise, things everyone will have heard about. So we knew that that was part of the mix, but we also knew there are other factors like equity, like the ability and inability to get access to care, affordability, like the ability and inability to have health insurance. So Dr. Lowne had a broad view and uh, I share that view. And so what we wanted to do was develop an index that would reflect that. So we did that and we included a number of metrics that are quite novel, really the first time they've been used. And you know we continue to do that work. We update it every year. And our goal and our hope is that as more and more people begin to understand the value of that point of view, more and more people will embrace it and begin to, you know, create uh, opportunities for improvement in each of those dimensions. So I have to say a plug that Southwestern Vermont Medical Center was very proud to rank fourth in the nation for value of care in 2020. Um, how would you describe what what we as, at SVMC and other hospitals that rank high uh, are doing well? Well, I, you know, I wish I had a, a pat answer. I mean, I, you know, I've been interviewed enough that I, I ought to have one, but yeah, <laughs> but I don't. And, and I think this is a truism of healthcare that while there are patterns and you can make statements that are general, uh, almost every situation is different. You know, those of us who are doctors know every patient is unique and, you know, you can't apply a cookbook to a patient, it's the same thing with hospitals. But I will say that um, New England in general did uh, quite well on this issue. So this one particular metric of value and in particular uh, avoiding unnecessary care. We actually published a paper in uh, one of the Journal of the American Medical Association mm -hmm. journals. And uh, in that paper, we found that you know New England does very well. Why is an interesting question. I think uh, the medical culture is a little more conservative. Uh, I think there has been a longer tradition of a little more scrutiny or regulation. And I think, you know, as Dartmouth uh, uh, researchers have shown, um, culture sort of propagates what, where you train and how you learn how to practice stays with you. And so I think that's probably a big factor. What we've seen is that for many of these uh, procedures, there are occasions when they're appropriate, and most of the time they're not. And those are the ones that we reported. We just simply counted them, and we counted them, you know, at every hospital, and then we did an assessment, you know, sort of normalized everything mathematically, so you could do apples to apples. And so I don't actually know the answer about your institution. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you kind of have to come and walk the halls and better understand it. Right. You probably are more, have more to tell me about that than I can tell you, actually. Well, I will elaborate a little bit on um, some of the cultural aspects. I think, I think most any physician you know, around the country, no matter where they live, New England or not, uh, wishes, of course, to do the right thing, uh, to minimize uh, harm and, 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 and focus on what they want to do, which is limit suffering, right? Not order yeah. tests. They want to limit, limit suffering. Uh, but they do have, uh, in a sense, they're sort of held to the standard of the region and, and what uh, others are doing in that region. And I face this all the time myself, every day in, that I practice. Um, the day that I, I don't face problems is the day I should retire, right? And so I struggle with the person in front of me. But really, it's not making changes uh, on the
on the fly for the patient in front of you. It, it's making those changes as a system so that what's expected uh, is, is more uniform in that way. And then I'll give an example. If we went out and, and told people, look, um, I'll just use the classic example that uh, Dr. Gwandi and others have focused on, echocardiograms in and, and young people with chest pain and very low risk of having acute coronary syndrome or, or heart attacks. Uh, if we said, look, you know, just don't do that, well, that, that doesn't really work very well. Uh, the person in front of you is suffering and you're trying to do the right thing for them. But if we say collectively, we're going to put in preventative measures that make it uh, where that's not the, the path of least resistance. In fact, uh, that you have to prove something beyond in order to get a particular type of study. Uh, then, um, and again, that was just an example I used. Uh, then it helps. It helps me when I have a conversation with a patient. It helps my colleagues understand how we're practicing. And then we measure those. But boy, it is anxiety provoking if you're a doctor or another type of healthcare worker, a technologist, a nurse, and the patient's in front of you and you're trying to explain why you're not going to do something and you start talking over yourself and realizing this is not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to change this particular encounter. We're trying to change uh, and motivate large system um, uh, efficiencies yeah. so that we reduce, reduce cost and improve outcomes. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think one of the most important things that I learned from Dr. Lown about all this is really that, um, you know, it, people want to be cared for. I mean, people don't particularly come in I mean, nowadays with the internet, they kind of do, so I, I get it. But but they don't usually come in saying, I want this test and this test and this test. They come in with a problem or a concern, and they want to be taken care of, and they want to be taken care of professionally, and they want to be taken care of knowing that, you know, all the right things are being done. And, you know, there's a risk of harm when you do stuff that isn't necessary. So it takes a dialogue, and I will say the emergency room is one of the hardest places because mm -hmm. it's it's very transient. Relationships, especially long-term longitudinal relationships, really matter in healthcare, and they really make a difference because when I know somebody and I know someone well, I know their history well, I know their family situation, I know their social situation, when they come in with a complaint, I have a good sense of whether this is a very weird thing that better be looked, you know, thought through and looked at carefully and, and no stone left unturned, or whether this is, oh, you know, it's, it's again one of those stressful times and, you know, the, that wayward son is home and all the stuff is going down. And, right, right. and so I think relationship based care is a fundamental part of this. And sadly, our healthcare system isn't really structured properly for that. That That's my personal opinion. Um, there's lots that we could do differently and do better. And that's why we started looking at these broader systemic metrics. So we include metrics of what we called civic leadership last year, and this year we're calling equity. That includes racial inclusivity, that includes community benefit investments that hospitals make, that also includes things like uh, pay equity, just trying to understand how, you know, workers in hospital settings are doing. Uh, and, you know, this year we're also looking, in addition to avoiding overuse, we're looking at uh, something we're calling cost efficiency, which, you know, sounds like a sort of bean counter thing, but it really is important, I think, to understand if we can get the same outcome, if we can get really great mortality, you know, for with much less trouble, with fewer kind of unnecessary things being done. That's a net positive for all of us. And of course we do look at mortality, we look at readmissions, those are kind of the standard things. So Right, right. Now for the audience, just all of the outcome variables, again, to reiterate, um, don't align with the amount of tests and things that are done. So can you just give us an example um, or a few of what is considered, and I don't even like this term, but it is the most appropriate, probably hospital overuse? Well, um, you know, we, we looked at um, a lot of research literature, and in the last 10 years um, in particular, there's been a lot of research on this. And there are a lot of things, a lot of tests and procedures that are 
not indicated or, or, or no longer indicated because of new evidence and science. And then there's a lot of procedures in the gray zone where they're indicated for some people, but mm -hmm. not for others. And it all depends on the clinical circumstance. So we may, we took great care not to have those in what we counted. So we looked at the stuff that is literally uh, pretty much accepted that, you know, it's really not indicated in the way, you know, it's done. And then we spent a lot of time coding to be sure the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria uh, were uh, good enough to reflect that. And then we had a group of us who've been in this area, doing research in this area for you know the past decade, uh, pick 12 services that are more hospital-based. There are quite a few that are you know in the outpatient setting, but only the ones that were hospital-based. And those are the ones we then counted up. We used claims data from Medicare, and we counted those up. Uh, and there are things like uh, arthroscopic knee surgery as opposed to just knee arthroscopy. Uh, it's uh, certain types of vertebroplasty, spinal fu certain types of spinal fusion. In my field of cardiology, stenting of coronary arteries when you know the condition is quite stable. Um, and you know there are others like that. So that's how we kind of picked a few. Uh, there's probably a lot more, as you know, as a clinician, there's probably a lot more uh, areas where we could do better, but those are in the gray zone where it takes a lot more understanding of the clinical picture. So it's really hard just from databases to figure that out. So we did not go there. And I think that's a whole other conversation, like how do we develop those uh, methods and tools to figure that out? Right, so part of that is um, is actually supporting the uh, physicians through these decisions. You know, I'm sure you see this all the time, but but people get defensive uh, when you start talking about again that word overuse or misuse. And and as an emergency physician, um, even in, in even what I love to do, which is focus on this stuff, I can still get a little defensive because in my head, um, the people that are talking about this aren't seeing the pressures that I'm seeing. And so really what it is, is supporting uh, us through uh, that these decisions are the right thing to do and that patients understand that and that most of the time, a vast, vast majority of the time, it will work out uh, well and in favor of the patient. Of course, we can't, we can't practice for these one-off rare things or, or we're not going to be able to afford that in healthcare. Plus, as you said, we do harm uh, yeah. patients. I mean, one of the problems is the harms are often invisible in the sense that we know there's a risk from any test or procedure. So it's a, it's a small risk most of the time, but it's a risk. Um, and if the procedure is totally indicated, then that complication or that harm, you know, as, as unfortunate as it will be, uh, and as much regret as we may have, you know, we kind of have to say, well, you know, we knew there was a risk and, and, and we took that chance and, and sadly this is how it turned out. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the problem is those events are rare and if you have a, a case where it really wasn't particularly necessary to do the test and there's a harm, it's not easy to connect those dots. And so right. while we know there are these harms, we can't connect the dots on any given case. Or, or let me put it this way, the cases where we can are very, very rare. Uh, but the ones where we can are are kind of uh, can be quite shocking. I mean, the f there's a famous one that was published uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association about a young woman with chest pain who, uh, you know, in the end probably really shouldn't have had a cardiac cath, um, but she did, and there was a tear on her uh, left anterior descending artery and a massive heart attack. So much so she ended up needing not just surgery. A heart transplant. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that stuff, you know, that's an anecdote. It's only one, thank God. But it sort of tells you that, you know, we're probably not looking and, and we may not be seeing. So it's incumbent on us to just practice, as, as, you know, the best we can. And I think, you know, there's a sort of ethic of parsimony, which is what, you know, that motto of Dr. Lyons really reflects. So as much as possible for as little as possible to. So. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have one of those that, that, that I learned a long time ago and now my memory has faded and I'm not sure how real it was in my head. It was a friend of mine, but um, 
this was someone practicing pediatrics in a rural part of another country and the child he diagnosed with Kawasaki's disease and then the child improved and was fine and so he sent them three hours away to the tertiary care center to get an echocardiogram because you do that after Kawasaki's because you can develop these coronary aneurysms so the family came back a few weeks later and he said I'm so sorry I don't have the report of the echo I'm just gonna have to call up and see what the results were and they said oh no they they wouldn't do it he said what do you mean they didn't do it I ordered it and they said yeah well they said it's not indicated and so he said what five percent of children with Kawasaki's get coronary aneurysms and they replied yes and only a very few percent of that five percent need anything done about it to begin with so I don't even know how true that is anymore I just thought it was a illustrative really interesting story and she said by the way you know on the way to this academic center our car broke down we incurred a lot of expenses and and it's sort of it's not near as bad as the heart transplant story you were telling but it does show that our decisions there do have consequences that may be unintended and so you know we need to practice in that way tell me tell me what does success look like from your perspective and from the Lowndes Institute well I think for us we feel that the role of the hospital can be and really must be part of a general transformation of our health care delivery system you know our system is famously incredibly expensive compared to much of the world the prices are pretty high and I don't think you know there is some unnecessary care obviously we've been talking about it but I don't think that's why you know these other issues are there we think there's issues of equity we think there's a lot that can be done so for us we also don't pretend that it's their simple solutions I personally favor you know some kind of a single-payer system and I think there are flavors of that we have barely begun to really understand that and explore what the different flavors of single-payer could be but that's an example it's not the whole story by any means it's just one example there's so many dimensions of how we need to improve things so that health care is much more responsive to local communities more accountable to local communities and families and you know really highly efficient that you know the the sort of the best possible outcomes and the best possible quality with with the least possible expenditure resources because you know we really need to be careful with how we spend our time and our money in order to be sure that everything we need to do in 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 the country gets done and increasingly you know at least the way I look at it a lot of that is going to be taken up with issues of climate and climate change so we have to really make our health care system you know really sleek you know like a like a you know super sports car that's just fast very efficient very good and honestly there's no reason in the world that families and patients shouldn't walk away from their encounters day in and day out feeling like it's the just the best damn system in the world but it's not it doesn't happen often enough and and you know I don't probably don't need to tell you the level of fragmentation and missed dropped connections and all these different dimensions and it doesn't seem to be getting better so we do need a transformation and our goal with this project is simply as I said to get that conversation started get more people engaged get more people interested in in think in things that are a little more than the kind of reputational rankings that you know generally are what the media tends to cover well, I tell you, I really appreciate um, what you had to say about recognizing that the solutions are, are complex themselves. Um, there's so much, when we talk about this topic, I think one of the reasons people get a defensive, um, feel defensive is because there's often a lot of finger pointing. You know, it, it's the emergency physician's fault. It's 
It's the uh, freestanding clinics in the South's fault. It's you know pointing fingers rather than saying it's it's not that. There are many many variables involved, and it's going to take time and cohesion to really uh, improve the system, which I think we all want. And that leads to some um, being optimistic, as, as you were there at the end, that we will improve the system. Yeah. Well, I think we can. I think there are you know different parts of the elephant that everybody kind of describes. What we haven't yet really had is a really hard, focused, determined, and sustained effort to really integrate it all into a common approach. So for example, when I talk about single payer, I favor single payer, but, but with a, a different payment structure than fee for service. And I, you know, there's a range of things you can talk about technically. I also think there's no reason in the world that a lot of what uh, patients and families experience couldn't be improved dramatically in ways that would make physicians, for example, you know, even more satisfied and, and right. more delighted with their work. And we know for sure that ain't so these days. So. That's right. Well, we will end there. Thank you so much for joining us today on Medical Matters Weekly. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. And, um, and you know, you can find information uh, on the web about the Lown Institute. Um, I'm also going to thank Cat TV, uh, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity. And we will see you again next week.